today because the topic at hand is, is a difficult one. And um, why does God allow evil and suffering? It's a great way to close out 2017, amen? It's a great question to answer as we head into 2018 because this is a question that if you're a human being, you've wrestled with. We've all felt pain and we've all experienced dis- just difficult times in our lives. About 12 years ago, I got a call. It was about 10, 30, 11 o'clock on a Sunday night. And there was a family that was a part of our church, and the husband was on the phone, and he was crying, and he was frantic. And he said, we need you to come over right now. My son has just shot himself. So I call a couple other leaders from the church, and we meet in front of this house, which they just live about three, four blocks away from us. And um, fire trucks and ambulances and everything was in the street. And uh, we walked up to the situation, and I got out of the car, and... um, some of the authorities met me, and I said I was the family pastor. And, and the father basically said, I want you to go in, and I want you to pray for the, for the situation in this house. And so me and these two other leaders from the church proceed to walk down this hallway. And it was one of the most surreal, one of the most oppressive moments ever in my life where you just felt this just evil hanging in the air. And there was a TV that was at full volume in a back bedroom, just just on a static channel. It was just, and would not stop. And as we're walking down the hallway, the sound of that static just grew louder and louder and louder. And as we turned the corner down the hallway and turned another corner to the bedroom, there on the floor was this 18-year-old boy. And he had taken a gun to his head. There was blood all over the walls. And in my mind, I couldn't translate whether this was fact or fiction. It just was so surreal seeing the body, seeing the gun, seeing the blood everywhere. This TV that was at full volume, it was just such a surreal moment. It was at that moment me and these other leaders, we just grabbed each other by the shoulders and started to pray over this situation. And we are crying And we are just pleading before God that somehow something good would come of this tragic situation. And at that moment, we got done praying. Someone had come in, one of the firefighters or ambulance drivers. Someone had turned off the TV. And and going from something like (laughs) to total silence was just, again, nothing I've ever experienced before. So we leave this room and we go across the street to the neighbor's house where the family had been gathered. And there were just people crying. There was mom and there was dad and there were the siblings and then there were just friends. And everyone was just weeping and wailing. And I walk into this house with these two other leaders from the church and I sit down and I'm just, I'm just hugging mom and dad. And this family had been through so much already This was just something that would just, I'm just praying, Lord, don't let this push them over the edge. They were recovering from alcoholism. There's recovery from drug abuse. There's a lot of stuff going on in this family. And I'm sitting in this house with about 20 people, and they're weeping. And just, the mom looks at me. And so that everyone can hear, she says, Why would God allow this to happen? And my heart dropped. And I had nothing to say at that moment. And then she followed up that question with, Is my son in heaven? These are the moments that the best... Religious education cannot prepare you for. This is the kind of situation that none of us are ever prepared for. Those are the kind of questions that sometimes we are, we are hard-pressed to answer. Where, where, where is God? Where was God? Why did God allow this to happen? Why didn't God do anything about it? Why, why, why? why well that night god gave me some opportunities to talk to the family 
But I knew that the real ministry wouldn't be that night. It would come in the days and the weeks afterwards. But what this family had gone through, as I mentioned the specifics, some of you can identify with similar situations. And if we're not talking about alcoholism or drug abuse or suicide, we're talking about other things. Life debilitating diseases that are irrevocable. Um, Loss of friends and family to diseases, loss of jobs, divorce, children that have gone astray. I mean, you name it, we've all felt pain in our life. And none of us are immune to going to that place and saying, why God? Why? I mean, there's, there's a world view of of evil and suffering, you turn on the news, and whether you're living 100 years ago, 50 years ago, today, I mean, we can talk about Hitler and the Holocaust, we can talk about Stalin, we can talk about Pol Pot, we can talk about Gaddafi, we can talk about the Yemeni crisis right now, where there's half a million children dying of starvation today. We can talk about the Rohingyas that are being driven out of of Bangladesh and have no place to to, to land. We can talk about uh, all these evils and all this suffering. And it's one thing to to have it out there, but we must also talk about individual experiences too, that we go through illness and abuse and broken relationships and betrayal and sorrow and injuries and disappointment and heartache and crime and death. And perhaps you've been asking the questions too, why? Why me? Why now? Where's God? Why do all these horrific things happen if there's a loving and powerful God? Why do bad things happen to good people? That why question is one of the mysteries of life. And I'm not going to tell you this morning that I'm going to answer all your questions. But I do believe that this morning this is going to be good because I want to provide a framework to try to understand things in general. And I pray that God would somehow apply those general principles to our lives specifically. Because all this came about when an atheist friend of mine about six weeks ago Facebook messaged me after the shooting of the people at the church uh, in Texas. And this atheist friend of mine who I knew through uh, FedEx when I worked there basically said, Scott Morgan, he called me out on Facebook, Scott Morgan, how would you address this question? If God's so good, why is there evil and suffering? And instead of laying into the, the, the discussion via Facebook, I asked him to meet me here. We had an hour-long discussion. And that just prompted me to say, I want to bring this to the church. And I want to deal with this under the the title, theodicy. Write that word down. This is a great word. T-H-E-O-D-I-C-Y. Theodicy. This is basically putting together a reasoned defense to make sense of the goodness of God in light of life's difficulties. We're going to study theodicy this morning. And unlike other messages where we're going to dive into the word and unpack certain, you know, bits of scripture verse at a time, I'm going to give you verses this morning, but this is going to be more for the mind and the heart. We're going to start with the mind, we're going to work our way to the heart, and we're hopefully going to make sense of this question, why does God allow evil and suffering? You'll notice in your notes there's five points I want to address that I want to talk through with you, and hopefully in the end, not only is God glorified, but your spirits are encouraged, and that, that you've come up with your own theodicy, a reason defense when people ask you, if God's so good, why is there evil and suffering? Because isn't that the, the, the trilemma that exists, right? God is all-powerful, God is all-loving, and yet evil exists, therefore there's no such thing as God. Does the topic of evil and suffering necessitate the absence of a God? And I'm going to tell you right now, what I started with with my atheist friend who asked me that question, I said, actually, even the evil and suffering provides us one of the best defenses for the existence of God rather than the absence of God. First point in your notes. The presence of evil and suffering. This is the experiential issue, Right? We know that there's something present. We wrestle with this presence of something that is evil, that is, uh, that is challenging to our, our lives and perhaps our faith. 
Does the presence of evil and suffering mean the absence of God? St. Augustine, 1,700 years ago, said this. If there is no God, why is there so much good? And if there is a God, why is there so much evil? And we exist between those two poles, right? There's good, there's evil, and we wrestle. And this is more a problem in the, in the West than it is the East. You see, you go in other places of the world where there are people who embrace Buddhism or Hinduism or, or Islam, these religions don't deal with this topic because in some, evil is just an illusion. And you might come up against somebody who says, oh, there's no such thing as evil, it's just an illusion. Those are the people I say, do you lock your door at night? Right? This is the view of the Christian scientists movement with Mary Baker Eddy. And it's Christian science. It's kind of like grape nuts. It's neither grape nor nuts, right? It's neither Christian nor science. <laughs> One of the mysteries of the, of the universe we've just solved right then and there. So, Evil is not illusion. It's a very felt thing. Uh, it's not karma, right? You're just paying your dues back to the universe. And, you know, in these cultures, Islam doesn't even deal with the topic at all. As a matter of fact, you know, what's amazing is in light of Christianity, no other religion, no other spirituality is so quick to meet the, the, the needs of people and to aid people like Christians. You don't hear of Islamic movements that go help the refugees or to help people who are dying of starvation or this or that. You don't see it because it doesn't factor into their worldview. And yet in the West... We who have the greatest comforts are the ones who wrestle with the problem of evil the most. It's not any other world system that wrestles with this. They just accept it because of their worldview. But it's we in the West who have the greatest comforts. We wrestle with the problem of pain. Why? Because this issue of theodicy is a felt issue. It's something that strikes at the core of who we are as human beings. It has to do with personhood. And so we have to realize that this is something not to be rejected. This is not something to be ignored. But this is something to dive into. Which brings us to our second point. The problem of evil and suffering. Here's where we're going to get philosophical. Because I will tell you philosophically that... Theism offers the best explanation due to the fact that evil is troubling to atheists, it is troubling to naturalists, logically leads to a standard of good or justice beyond the world. My friend asked me, if God is so good, why is there evil and suffering? And I press back and say, by what standard of good are you measuring your evil against? C.S. Lewis said, unless one knows of a straight line, there's no way you can tell me a line is crooked. See, what the atheist, what the naturalist, what the materialist is hard-pressed to do is to give you some sort of ultimate objective standard of good. Because if they can't do that, then by what means do they have anything to measure evil by? So the philosophical conundrum is that if God created things and if evil is something real, then he must be the author of evil, the atheist would say. Well, now you're assuming an absolute moral law, and if there's an absolute moral law, there's got to be an absolute moral law giver. So where does this come from? Where does this innate sense of good and evil come from? There's got to be an objective standard beyond you and I, beyond our whims and our wishes that goes to something beyond us and I believe ultimately points to a supreme moral law giver. If there's no moral law giver, there's no moral law. If there's no moral law, then there's no good. And if there's no good, there's no evil. Why are we having this discussion? There is good. There is a moral law. There is a standard. And there is a moral law giver. And yet, those logical presuppositions go out the window because of the existentially felt issues involved with the question. If God's good, why is there evil and suffering? We have to stop and engage not just the heart issues that we feel, but we have to engage our minds and get back to a place of objective 
reasoning. C.S. Lewis said it like this, If the universe is so bad, how on earth did human beings ever come to attribute it to the activity of a wise and good creator? 90% of the world, 90% of all human beings that ever lived, usually in more painful circumstances than us, they believe in God. There is something within us as human beings that is significant. But yet, usually the question of God's existence, usually the question of evil and suffering and disproving God, comes not from those that are in the muck and the mire and the difficulties. It comes from those that exist in their comforts as outsiders speaking to those that are really not involved with the painful things of this world. The new atheists, write down the names like Christopher Hitchens, who died a few years ago. Um, Richard Dawkins, the God illusion. Sam Harris. Uh, Letters to a Christian Nation, he wrote that. See, what the new atheism embraces is this idea that religion just brings about evil and good, and because religion is the instrument of evil, I mean, evil and, and suffering, not evil and good. That's weird, huh? Some of you are like, what? That doesn't make sense. The new atheism deals with the problems that religion brings. And what's amazing in, with the new atheists is that they're a bunch of outsiders that can write books and sell out arenas and speak on these topics, but they're not in the thick of it. And it's, so it's easy as an outsider, an outsider observer who are, who are comfortable that, you know what, they, they can't speak to these issues as outsiders. Someone once said this, it is the spectators, the people who are outside looking at the tragedy from whose ranks the skeptics come, it is not those who are actually in the arena who know the suffering from the inside. Indeed, the fact that it is the world's greatest sufferers who have produced the most shining examples of unconquerable faith. So there's a philosophy involved that now says, you guys have to acknowledge a moral framework in order to label something evil. And my friend, as we're talking outside on the patio for coffee, couldn't answer that. Where does this standard of good come from? Which brings us to our third question, or third point. It's this, the principle of evil and suffering. Now let's get theological, let's get biblical. Let's talk about the principle of what is evil, where does evil come from, did God create the world like this, etc., etc., etc. Four points under this I want to talk about. Number one, God in creation. Number two, man in freedom. Number three, Jesus and redemption. And number four, eternity and restoration. So the first question that usually people will ask is, why didn't God merely create a world where tragedy and suffering didn't exist? You ever thought about that? He did. Genesis chapter 1, verse 31 says this, God saw all that he had made and it was very good. Boom. I'm excited about the new series we're going to dive into in Genesis and under, un, unpack the origin story. Because if you don't understand where we've been, you don't understand the design of things, you'll never understand your life, your purpose, significance, meaning, your relationships, your role in the world, etc., etc., etc. But let's just start Genesis 1. God created the world and he puts a thumbs up and says it's very good. So the problem isn't that God didn't create the world perfect. He did. Which brings us to our second point. Enter man and woman. Enter Adam and Eve. Enter the most unique aspect of God's creation. Human beings created in the image of God with a morally free will. Man and freedom. See, God created men and women with the capacity not only to love God to the ut- uttermost degree, but also with the capacity to hate God to the uttermost degree. So you can't have moral freedom unless you give man the ability to go to one of two extremes. In order to love, you have to hate. And we don't realize that you know, well, why did God create human beings like that? Because if you create a, a creature that is not morally free in their choices and understand their moral responsibilities, 
then you really actually don't have a morally free agent and you've just created a robot for yourself. Hence the rise of the AI relationships in our culture. Right? I'm going to go shop for a husband or a wife that doesn't say anything nasty to me, that doesn't do anything negative to me, that doesn't hurt me. Well, how would you like to wake up each and every day and have your companion say to you, I love you today, all because you pushed the button and programmed them for them to say that? See, when you enter into a relationship, you have to realize that there is the, there's the possibility of them taking you to the highest heights, and there's also the ability for them to take you to the lowest of lows. That's what it means to have freedom. This is why people continue to have babies. Going into parenting, I knew that my children would bring me the greatest joys, but they would also probably cause me the deepest heartbreak. Right? No one goes into parenting going, my child's going to be perfect. They're not. They're going to disappoint you. They're going to make wrong choices. They're going to make poor decisions. So there's this very real possibility that they may, you may suffer disappointment or pain or heartbreak, and they may even hurt you. But why do we have kids? Because you know that there's also the potential for tremendous joy and deep love and great meaning that's going to happen through that relationship. And so... God creates man and woman in his image with this capacity for moral freedom. And if you create man and woman with this capacity for moral freedom, you have to realize that while there's this amazing potential for good, there's also an amazing potential for bad. And here's what I do not want you to miss. While God created the possibility for man to choose love, to choose hate, to choose obedience, to choose disobedience. It's man that actualizes that potentiality. God creates the possibility, man actualizes it. The source of evil is not in, it's not God's power, but the source of evil is man's freedom. If he's created us morally responsible agents, there is the potential for us to morally be irresponsible, to misuse our freedom and hurt people. And this is what sets us apart from the rest of creation. No other created creature has this moral responsibility. You don't tell me man has no meaning. You don't tell me man has no significance. We do because we are the only creature created in the image of God who have been wired with the ultimate potential for good, but also with the capacity to have the potential greatest uh, ability to do evil. That's why when we talk about all the Hitlers and the Stalins and the Pol Pots and the Husseins, they're that much more Mother Teresa's and Martin Luther King Jr.'s and Billy Graham's, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I want you to write down three words as we're talking about this. These three words are what men and women throughout church history have involved in the discussion of, of evil. One is negation. One is privation. And the other is actual. And I just briefly want to um, show off my $20,000 seminary degree. Yes! I know, no. I I am working on my doctorate, more about that later, but... What is evil as negation? Negation. When we, when we speak of evil, the Bible talks about something good... And when there's not that good or there's a negation of the good, it speaks of terms like ungodliness. The good is godliness. The negation of it is ungodliness. Unrighteousness. Injustice. See, these are ideas that we have to wrestle with that evil is spoken of as a negation of the good and it is dependent upon the good for its own definition. You can't have unrighteousness unless you understand what the good righteousness is. So there's this idea of negation that the Bible speaks of. There's also the issue of privation. 
And this is where Augustine again says, and I love this, evil is a parasite. Parasite has to have a host by which it feeds off of. And when we think of privation, we think of something that ought to be present but isn't. There is no such thing as a hole in my Christmas sweater. I did get a Christmas sweater this year, and I showed my wife, and there's a hole on the shoulder. Now, is that hole a thing? No. It's the absence of something that should be there, and that is a properly knitted sweater. And so privation is, you know, when we speak of evil, it's not necessarily a thing. It requires something like a host, and so that hole is not a thing. It's the absence of something that should be there. You know, there's no such thing as darkness. Darkness is just the absence of light. There's no such thing as blindness. Blindness is just the absence of sight. There's no such thing as cold. Cold is just the absence of, you guys are getting, you're getting this. And so what we acknowledge with evil is that there is something that should be there that isn't. That's why history has given us men and women who speak of evil as a privation. So, with evil and suffering being actually great evidence for the existence of God, we are acknowledging that something should be present but isn't. But evil also is actual. And while evil is not something that exists in and of itself, it is real, its effects are real, its impacts are devastating, and I don't ever want to minimize the difficulties we go through as human beings when we struggle with these issues. So we live in a world where God has allowed for the possibility of people to misuse their freedom and to be significantly free, we have to be morally responsible. And there's more, no more important area than for us to be morally responsible to each other. Now, the question you may ask yourself is, why doesn't God intervene every time someone is going to be morally irresponsible? Well, what freedom is there in that if God steps in every single time? Like... If I give my wife $100, which she would love, and I say, here's $100, spend it however you wish, we go out, and she tries to spend that money, and I stand in the way and say, no, I don't want you to buy that. Oh, no, 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 I don't, I, I don't want you to buy that. And I basically block her from exercising her freedom to do with the money that I gave her. Is she truly a free moral agent able to spend that money the way she wishes? No, if I stand in every time. So what you have to understand is that even though when I give that gift, there's the potential that that gift may be misspent in a way that I don't want to have happen, but I must allow that to take place and for her to be a morally free agent. So a freedom which is prevented from being exercised whenever it's going to be misused, it simply is not freedom. So again, God creates the possibility of misuse moral responsibility but it's man and women that actualize that potentiality which now brings us to the third point and this is where it gets really good jesus and redemption john 16 verse 33 who's got it read it out loud somebody read it loud in your best morgan freeman voice i don't know Who's got John 16, 33? Okay, nice and loud. Stand up if you would, Pat. Pam, sorry. <laughs> I'm evil, aren't I? <laughs> Pam. I have said these, these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. Okay, stop right there. So Jesus speaks to the audience, and says, I, I have peace, but you need to know you're going to live in a world where there's going to be tribulation. Not if, but you will. There's, there's a certainty. Thanks, Jesus. Appreciate that, right? But notice what he says after. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Okay. In one verse, we have this glorious good news. 
There will be evil suffering. There will be difficulties. There will be tribulations. Thank you, Pam, for reading that. But also, Jesus gives us that note of encouragement. But behold, I have overcome the world. We don't worship a deity who is detached or distant, but we worship a God who dives into the difficulty of evil and suffering along with us and overcomes and promises us something awesome. It's called redemption. Now here's the thing we have to realize is that no other religion teaches this. There is no other religion out there where not only does the leader claim to be divine in and of themselves, Mohammed, Socrates, Confucius, Buddha, whoever you want to worship and follow, they never claim for themselves deity status. They never perform miracles. They don't claim the things Jesus claimed. They don't do the things Jesus did. And especially they don't rise from the dead after being crucified. So Christianity is set apart from all other world religions. And what the cross shows us, what Jesus and redemption accomplishes, is that God says, I'm going to go beyond justice and incredibly take all the suffering and evil upon myself. See, what we have to wrestle with when it comes to Jesus and his truth claims and the cross is that here we have God entering our pain by putting his son to grief. That's why Isaiah 53 verse 5 says this, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and with his stripes we are healed. See, this is the remarkable truth of our faith in Jesus is that he enters the difficulty, he enters the evil, he experiences the suffering. So now we have this high priest, the Bible says, who can identify with us in all the things we go through. No one went through it worse than Jesus. And someone once said, God's ultimate answer to suffering isn't an explanation, it's the incarnation. Merry Christmas, ladies and gentlemen. Just when you're thinking, how does this relate to the holidays? How does this relate with Christmas trees and presents and stockings and jingle bells and and, an elf and Santa's beard smelling like beef and cheese? I'll tell you why this is relevant. It's because God is not going to give you explanations. He's going to give you himself. And Jesus is there in the lowest places of our lives. And my question to you is, are you broken? He was broken for us. Are you despised? He was despised and rejected by men. Do you cry out that you can't take it anymore? Well, he was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Has someone ever betrayed you? He was sold out by people he'd spent so many years with. Are your most tender relationships broken? Well, he was loved and then he was rejected. Has anyone ever turned from you? Well, these are people that the Bible says they hid their faces from him. Corey Ten Boom said it like this. No matter how deep our darkness, he is deeper still. So what God does with Jesus' redemption on the cross is he takes the worst event in all of human history and turns it into the greatest event in all of human history. This is remarkable about Jesus and redemption. The worst tragedy in history brought about the most glorious event in history. And one of my favorite quotes by a woman named Dorothy Sayers who was a contemporary of C.S. Lewis and J.K. Chesterton and She says this, For whatever reason God chose to make man as he is, limited in suffering and subject to sorrows and death, but he had the honesty and the courage to take his own medicine. Whatever game he's playing with his creation, he has kept his own rules and played fair. He can exact nothing from man that he has not exacted from himself. 
He has himself gone through the whole of human experience from the trivial irritations of family life and the cramping restrictions of hard work and lack of money to the worst horrors of pain, humiliation, defeat, despair, and death. When he was the man, he played the man. He was born in poverty and died in disgrace and thought it well worthwhile. Thank you, Dorothy. I will. I will post that on Facebook. All the quotes I used this morning, I will post on Facebook. Which means you've got to become friends. Can we do that? Why can't we be friends? Okay. Number four, eternity and restoration. See, if, if what Christ did by taking the worst event in all of human history and turning it into the most glorious event, not only is it true for him, but there's something true for us. Hit eternity and restoration. C.S. Lewis in the book, The Great Divorce, says this, Heaven once attained will work backwards and turn even that agony into a glory. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. For this momentary light affliction that is being prepared for us in the eternal weight of glory, be all, all, all comprehension, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. For God is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory that the smallest irritation to this world will not compare to the glory that is yet to come. Our sufferings will pale in comparison to the good things God has in store for his followers. Romans 8, verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Let's just illustrate that real quick. Tomorrow, January 1st, 2018. Let's just say tomorrow. You wake up and you're going to go to spend time with fam- friends or family you get into a car accident. You find out that the other driver doesn't have insurance. You get through all that rigmarole, and then you get to your friend's house, and all of a sudden, a couple hours later, you get food poisoning because the salmon log was left out too long. Car accident, food poisoning. I know, disgusting, isn't it? And then all of a sudden, on a holiday, your boss calls you and says, don't come in January 2nd, you've lost your job. But not only that, all of a sudden your tooth starts to hurt and you have to go to an emergency room and you find out you have to have an emergency root canal. This is all in one day. I know, just go back to bed. But then you find out that you have uh, bed, bed bugs in your bed. <laughs> Come on, let, let, let's keep going with this, right? Basically, your life has turned into Scott and the terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. That's January 1st, and the hot water goes out, and the heat breaks, and all this stuff, right? One day, and the cowboy, yeah, I've already dealt with that whole Cowboys losing thing, so. January 1st, what a horrible year this has turned out to be. But say for the next 364 days, you meet the relationship of your dreams. You get the best job promotion possible. Your friend wins the lottery, buys you a new car. Yeah. You, uh, all these good things start happening to you. And all of a sudden, a year from now, someone says, how was 2018? You're going to sit there and go, it was the best year ever. Why? Because those 364 days of experiencing such goodness made up for the one day that started off that was a train wreck. This is just helping us get this all in the, in the proper framework. St. Teresa said this hundreds of years ago. In light of heaven, the worst suffering on earth, a life full of the most atrocious tortures on earth, will be seen as no more serious than one night in an inconvenient hotel. So if God has the power to eradicate evil and suffering, why doesn't he do it? Let's stop. Because I want him to. But there's two things we need to consider. One is this. If he's going to eradicate evil and suffering, number one, that involves you. You want God to eradicate you right here, right now? Because here's the fact that we are evil people. We are sinful people. We cause hurt. We cause pain. Pain is not only inflicted upon us, we inflict the pain upon others. Do you really want God to do something about this? Because it may involve you. 
And I say may because here's the second point. Second Peter chapter three, verse nine says the Lord is not slow regarding his promise, but he is patient. Why? So that everyone may come to repentance. Before you want God to t- take care of all the evil and suffering in the world, you better make sure you're good with God and lean heavily upon his mercy, which is perfectly displayed for us in the person and work of Jesus Christ, the cross. And I know when judgment finally comes and God will right every wrong and deal with every injustice, etc., etc., I know because of what Jesus has done for me and I've received that, I will be spared from the wrath that's to come. So before you're quick to say, God, do something about it now, you better make sure you've leaned upon his mercy. And the reason he has prolonged him doing anything to correct all the wrongs in the world is because there are still, to this day, men and women bowing their knee to the lordship of Jesus Christ. God's delay is to allow more people to be saved. And I will tell you that justice delayed is not justice denied. It will happen. But the question is, where are you in the midst of it? C.S. Lewis, once again, C.S. Lewis spoke a lot about pain. That's why we, we reference a lot. Lewis said this, God whispers to us in our pleasures, but he shouts to us in our pain because pain is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. So take the pain and go before the Lord and say, God, what do you want me to learn from this? What do you want me to be attentive to with this? Because the four, around the fourth point, the p- purpose of evil and suffering. There is a purpose. For the person that says there's no purpose, they don't understand the idea of, of purpose. Like they understand all, it's like saying, you know, Aslan gets killed on the stone table and when that moment happens in the great C.S. Lewis book of the, of the Chronicles of Narnia, we throw it down and say, that's not right for the author to do that. Well, you're only halfway through the book. Or if you're talking about Katniss Everdeen and, and PETA in District 12 and the Capitol and that whole issue and you throw down the book halfway through and say, it's not fair that Katniss is treated like that. Well, you haven't finished the book. It's not fair to the author if you only read something halfway and don't understand how it's all going to end. For you to say that there's no good purposes means that you know ultimately all things that are going to happen and you know the end results of all these things. And let's be honest, you don't. And so evil, while it is not good, it is good that there is evil. Because it does several things in our lives. Number one, it develops character. Romans chapter 5. You ready for this, you guys? If not, just go, la, 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 (laughs) la. Suffering produces patience. Patience produces endurance. Endurance produces hope. There's a reason why we go through the difficulties, and perhaps it's to develop character. Helen Keller said this, character cannot be developed in ease and quiet. Only through experience of trial and suffering can the soul be strengthened, vision cleared, ambition inspired, and success achieved. Number two, evil teaches us moral consequences. The discipline of a parent that says, and I know this from my own experience of raising children to my daughter, and she remembers this to this day, Riley, don't touch the hot stove. You'll burn yourself. And all of a sudden, she touches the hot stove. And there's a biblical principle in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 that says, whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. You have to realize that there are moral consequences to our decisions. People sin because of their own sin and folly. I can't blame the professor for a failing grade if I don't study. Right? Evil warns us of impending danger. The firefighters that get out there and have to burn part of the forest down to prevent greater burning of the forest. 
the police chase, which I love police chases. I'm, I, if you ever want to get me just like distracted, send me a police chase video. I love those so much. But how many times have you ever seen the police chase where they have to do something to the criminal's car because they know there's a school crossing down the street? Right? In order to m- make the danger worse, they've got to take care of some danger now. Number four, to avoid greater suffering. I go to the dentist. I, I can't stand a dentist. So there's a lot of dentist reference when it comes to my talking about evil and suffering. I'm not an anti-dentite yet. Yet. But if I sit there in the dentist chair and they kind of poke around and there's a sensitivity there, what is that telling me? That I better have something done because it could get worse. Right? Would you rather have a cavity now or a, a horrible root canal later? So sometimes evil suffering happens to avoid greater suffering. What about number five? Evil gets our moral attention. It's the reason why Jesus said it's not the well that need a doctor, it's the sick. And we're not imperfect people who need growth. C.S. Lewis said like this, we are rebels who need to lay down our arms. But lastly, perhaps evil and suffering enters our lives so that we may know God deeper that we would be men and women like Joseph in Genesis, whose family treated him horribly, specifically his brothers, and went, went through one horrible situation to another, to another, another. And at the end of Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, he's able to stand with his brothers, forgive them, and tell them what they meant for evil, God intended for good. Something in the experience allowed Joseph to know God deeper. Job, are we to accept evil, uh, good from God and not evil? When God strips everything out of your life, there's a reason why Job declares, I know that my Redeemer lives. There's a reason why Paul can celebrate from prison and tell people about joy. Even go through the most horrible of hardships. One of my favorite writers, a guy named Frederick Beekner, said this. Just say the name. It sounds impressive, right? He says, when the worst happens or almost happens, a kind of peace comes. I had passed beyond grief, beyond terror, all beyond hope, and it was there in that wilderness that for the first time in my life I caught sight of something of what it must be like to love God truly. It was only a glimpse, but it was like stumbling upon fresh water in the desert. I loved him because there was nothing else left. I loved him because he seemed to have made himself as helpless in his might as I was in my helplessness. I loved him not so much in spite of there being nothing in it for me, because almost because there was nothing in it for me. For the first time in my life, there in that wilderness, I caught what it must be like to love God truly for his own sake, to love him no matter what. Is there a purpose? Yeah. Because then we come to the classic verse, and we're going to close it up with this. The promise in evil and suffering. Romans 8, 28. For God causes all things to work together for good to those that love him who are called according to his purpose. Now, stop. Before you're so ready to throw that on a Hallmark card, put it in a text message, you need to stop and just really consider the weightiness of that passage. Because I want you to notice that it doesn't say that God causes evil and suffering. It says two things. Number one, that God promises to cause good to come out of suffering. God promises to do something with the terrible, the horrible, the tragic, the difficult. He promises in His sovereign, creative, all-knowing ability, He's able to cause something to be good to come out of something that was bad. God can create the world out of nothing. God can turn the cross as the most despicable of events into the most glorious of events with the resurrection. God can enter into my realm and turn that which I deem as horrible into something awesome. God has the power to do this. God causes all things to work together for good. Somehow, someway, God will cause all events to all situations in human history to turn around and glorify Him in some way, in some respect. But secondly, I want you to notice that the promise is not made to everyone. Don't tell your friend who has no semblance of God in their life, buck up. God's going to cause all things to work together for good. 
That's not a promise for everyone. God will do what? He'll make everything good that was bad for those who are called who walk according to his purposes. So for us who believe in Jesus, here's the promise that God will restore and he will redeem. Here's the promise that he will turn it into something good for his glory and our benefit. We may not understand now, but we will spend eternity learning how our God has the ability to do this. God took the very worst thing that has ever happened in human history, deicide, the death of God on the cross, and turn it into the best thing that has ever happened in history. If God can do that in that event, what can he do with our lives? Because here's the promise of the book of Revelation. No more tears, no more sorrow, no more death, no more disease, no more traffic tickets, no more ripped packages in the mail, No dogs throwing up on your new carpet. No kids touching hot stoves. No cars getting a flat tire just when you got the the tires replaced, et cetera, et cetera. You know all those inconveniences? There'll be none of that. The words of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. Let these soak into your soul. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. Let that, let that soak in. You have no idea. You have no idea. So here's, here's where you're at. I know where I'm at. Doesn't mean my struggle is any less than yours, but there's an optimism, and there's a hope in me, and I want you to, to wrestle with this yourself. What is happening in your life Will it drive you away from God or is it going to press you closer to Him? Because if Jesus in John 16, 33 says, I have come to bring peace, because you're going to go through suffering, will you press into Him and experience His overcomingness in your experience or will you continue to be driven away? My mom died of a brain tumor two months, diagnosed and dead. I was 15 years old. And for me, that event pressed me closer to the heart of Christ as a teenager. It did the same for my brother. It did the same for my sister. Coming out of atheistic, agnostic family, we all not only experience the love of Christ, we all go into full-time ministry. This is an amazing thing. But for other members of my family, they allowed that root of bitterness to grow even deeper in their hearts against God. And now they are spending eternity apart from the love of Jesus Christ. Because they didn't realize that God's megaphone was shouting to them at this moment. Your daughter, your sister, your mom, yeah, she's passed away. Praise God, my mom loved Jesus. In only the two years, she was just a little baby in, in Christ. She knew Jesus, and I, knew, I know one day I'll be re- reunited with her. And one day you'll meet Susan Morgan. She, she's a party animal, I'll tell you what. She liked her Barry Manilow. I'm going to tell you that. She liked her Barry Manilow. Or some people call it Barely Man Enough. <laughs> Whatever you want to call it. So, uh, Copa, Copa Cabana. Hey! Good entertainer. You got to put it there, right? Like, my mom had good taste in music. So, one day you'll meet her if you know Jesus. We'll, we'll all be reunited in heaven. And what I learned as a 15-year-old through my mom's death also allowed me to navigate seasons of infertility with my wife and trying to have children and going through those wastelands of of spiritual wrestling and being betrayed by friends and being asked to leave a church that I was a pastor at and I had started that I invested my life blood into. Uh, I've been through some difficulties, you guys. But I'm going to tell you this. It always pays to follow Jesus Christ. I've seen men and women allow that bitterness just to grow deeper in their heart and fight against God. And you know, that's a battle you will never win. And today is the day of salvation. Realize that God is not distant. He's not detached. He's involved. 
in our difficulties because he himself has gone through it. And he does it for you so that he tells you you're not alone. And what God promises in the difficulty is his presence and his peace. But that, that, that can only come as a result of knowing him personally. So more than anything, I want you to have a personal relationship with Christ. So make it your resolution not to go to the gym and not to change your diet and not to be nicer to your kids and your neighbors. Make it your, re- 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 uh, your resolution this year to know Jesus deeply. Amen? I hope God has used something today. This is something we all go through. We all wrestle with. But God is so good and He's so awesome. He will not allow anything to be wasted for His glory and your good. Just know that. Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, thanks for meeting us here in this place today. Thank you for allowing us to wrestle through these things. And I... I, I, I admit this is such a big and weighty and heavy topic, and I don't claim to have the answers. But, Lord, I hope that somehow this morning you've provided something for each and every one of us to just grab a hold of. That somehow, some way, you have showcased the, the b- majesty and the beauty of Jesus, and that you've, all pr- you've pricked all of our hearts to, to cling to him. There is no answer better than Christ. There is no security greater than Christ. There is no explanation better than Jesus. And I pray that every single person would know him. And by knowing him, we are now able to navigate not just life's blessings, but life's difficulties. Lord, thank you for being so good to us, for showing us that you love us and that you demonstrate your love for us by sending your son to die for us so that in him we may have hope. I pray that is true for every single person here today. Lord, thank you for loving us, for taking care of us, for for your faithfulness to us, and we're looking forward to how you're going to continue to show yourself to be mighty and awesome in this coming year. May we live for your glory. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord continue to lift his face toward you, give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Have a great day. Happy New Year, guys. See you next year. I always like saying that. See you next year. Bye-bye.